It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Joe Wiesner, we share your beautiful home in Jerusalem. And Joe, you were born in Hungary. You were born in Hungary? Yes, I was born in Budapest. Can you tell us a little bit about your family and growing up? Okay. And how you survived against all odds of the Shah? Yes. Okay, <coughs> my name is Joe Wiesner. I was born <coughs> in Budapest, Pest, Hungary, 19, June 1941. Um, at the age of four, uh, we were taken into uh, the Budapest ghetto with my grandmother, with my two sisters and two cousins, and we survived in the ghetto. My father was deported to Mauthausen. He, he returned as a very sick man. Slowly he recovered. My mother was deported to Bergen-Belsen and she perished. She was still alive when the British liberated the camp in April of 45, but she was too far gone. She had typhus and she did not survive. After the war, uh, when my father came back, we lived in Budapest, and I went to public school and uh, in 1956 the Hungarian Revolution broke out. I was 15 years old and my two sisters and I escaped Hungary into Austria. My, my father, our father came back after us and we all met in Vienna. We ended up in a camp run by the highest, and the highest uh, brought us to Camp Kilmer, in New Jersey, and we started a new life in America, in Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. I went to high school in Chicago, and I went to the University of Illinois in Chicago, and, uh, and uh, I met my wife in 1968. Well, I graduated in 1965 from college and I got a job with Western Electric, which was a subsidiary of AT&T company. And uh, I met my wife in 68 and we got married in 1970. We have two children, David and De 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 Debbie. Uh, we worked, my wife became a, a public school teacher in Chicago and I kept on working at AT&T until, until 2009 and we both retired. Before that, our son made Aliyah and after my son made Aliyah, about two years later, our daughter also made Aliyah. Our son lives, lives in uh, Ramat Shlomo and our daughter lives in Ramat Beit Shemesh. And we made our yes in 2009 and we have lived in Jer Jer Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, ever since then. Amazing. Jeff, can I ask, what is your earliest memories? My earliest memories, memories it's a good question. My earliest memories are that I was in the ghetto. I still remember there was an air raid. Americans were bombing Budapest at, at night. And the building across the street from the ghetto got a direct hit. And then they came on a, on a loudspeaker and said, the Jews are not allowed to look at what happened. Anybody who's caught looking at the devastation will be shot. So I was a little kid and I peeked a little bit out the window and I do remember dead bodies being lowered because the building collapsed until the first floor. And uh, I remember dead bodies being lowered on a wooden plank 
from the first floor down to the street level. That's one of the things I remember. I also remember uh, on the day of liberation, I think January 19, 1945, Russians came into the ghetto and I remember a Russian soldier took, uh, looked at me and tore off my yellow star. I had a yellow star on my winter coat and he told me that Hitler kaput and he kept on screaming Hitler kaput. He gave us a big can of something. We didn't know what it was. It had no labels. We opened it up and it was meat stew. And for us that was you cannot believe the meal we had from that meal, that meat stew that Russian soldier gave to us. So I was liberated by the Red Army, and I'm always grateful for that. Do you remember your home? Yes. You yes, I remember. I remember we lived on Tukaliu 28, which is the seventh district of Budapest. And I grew up there, it was a, was a one bedroom, actually it was, the bedroom was the living room and the dining room, it was a one bedroom, a one room home with a kitchen. And as I said before, I went to public school, I remember going to public school from until the eighth grade. I did graduate from public school at, at, uh, in 1956, just before the revolution. And uh, that's where I lived, uh, and I went to school there. My sisters were, uh, started to work, they were older than me. My, my older sister was seven years older, and my younger sister was six years older than I. So they were, they were uh, uh, my younger sister got a job in a laboratory as an anal anal analytical chemist. And my older sister uh, stayed home. She was a real mother to me. She was just like a mother because I had no mother. And um, it was, it was, we were happy, but we were very, very poor. And I certainly, and my sisters as well, we wanted to leave Hungary the worst way possible. And Jack, can I just ask, when, when the war broke out, because Hungary, the Nazis came and the Germans came much later, in 44. When, when the, the war broke out uh, in 1939, when the Germans attacked Poland, but Hungary was on the side of the Germans, and Hungary joined the, the, the German war effort, but Hungary was not occupied by Germany, by the German army, until March of 1944. There were deportations from Hungary, but it was very spotty. The, uh, uh, there were labor camps. The Jews, male, male Jews, uh, were, were uh, inducted or forced into labor camps. And, uh, and that's where they were, they were working. The women were, did not, were not re deported in Budapest. They were not deported until 1944, 43-44. When the Germans occupied Hungary in March of 44, the eastern part of the country where most of the Jews lived were deported. The Jews were rounded up and they were deported directly to Auschwitz. We lived in Budapest and did not, that did not affect us until later on. And do you remember leaving your home to go to the ghetto? I remember leaving the ghetto, the, excuse me, my, my home. They marched us to the ghetto. We, we did not live that far from the ghetto. It was, it was walking distance, not, not a near distance, but it was within walking distance. And I remember I was carrying a big pot with a, with a string on my, on, my, on my neck, and I was beating the pot like a drum. And the non-Jews were looking at us, and they were laughing, they were really <laughs> laughing.
as I remember uh, going walking from my home to the ghetto. You remember them laughing at you? Yes, I remember because I was, you know, a little kid walking with a big pot on my on a string on my neck. And the house that you had in in Budapest? Yes. Um, was it a traditional home? It was. It was a, a, a regular um, apartment building. But were, uh, were your family traditional? Were they? Well, uh, yes, we were traditional. Not 100 percent, but we were Shomer Shabbat, and uh, we kept all the holidays, obviously. And uh, we were a very traditional Jewish family. Yes. We kept Shabbat, and we had Kiddush, we had chicken soup on <laughs> Friday nights. Do you remember going to synagogue to this? I remember going to the synagogue. The synagogue, by the way, is not there anymore, but I do remember we had a beautiful synagogue, small scale, but it was an Orthodox synagogue, um, Ashkenazi synagogue. Do you remember the name? Garayut, Garayut so. Well, the, the synagogue was named after the street it was on. The street that was on was called Garayut so. And that's where the synagogue was. It's not there anymore. Uh, in 1956, a lot of the Jewish people left Hungary. A lot of them. And when you went to the ghetto, did you know that it was going to, that you weren't coming back to your home again? No. No, I, 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 they told me we were going to the ghetto, but at my age, I did not, uh, I was not able to. How old were you when you went to the ghetto? In the ghetto, I was uh, three and a half years old. Three and a half. And, and you still remember walking? I, re I remember walking, yes, I remember walking. I remember, like I said, a little things about the ghetto. I remember the bombing. And I remember when the Russians liberated us. I do remember that. And do you remember being hungry? Very hungry? Very hungry. I, they tell me that I used to kick my grandmother's foot, complaining that I was hungry. Please give me food. I, I, then I, my sister told me that, my older sister. We were very hungry. We were very hungry. We had, uh, my grandmother, um, the Jews were, at one time, I don't know when it stopped, they were allowed to leave the ghetto until 5 p.m. to go and buy food. And if, if you didn't return to the ghetto by 5 p.m., if they caught you on the street, they had all right to, to shoot you or arrest you or do whatever. My grandmother at one time was not able to make it back to the ghetto by 5 p.m. And the young Nazi um, Hungarian, they were called the Arrow Cross, caught her and asked her, what are you doing outside of the ghetto? You, you're not supposed to be outside of the ghetto. And my grandmother told us that she went down on her knees, kissed this young guy's feet and begged him to let her go back to the ghetto because she was taking care of five grandchildren. And by some hook and by some miracle, I guess, he let her go and she was able to come back and she never went out again. Now we had, my father was in the toy business and he had a non-Jewish partner who took over the business after my father was deported and believe it or not his wife was a German woman and this German woman used to bring us food once a week and she was our angel she was our guardian angel she brought us food and that helped us to survive because there was no food that was the biggest problem was food Water we had, but we did not have food. That's incredible. Yes. That a, a German lady would do that. Yes. And just come to the ghetto. She came to the ghetto and she spoke fluent German, so nobody would challenge her. 
uh, of course. And she would bring us some food once a week. Did you keep in touch with her after the war? Yes, we did. We kept in touch with her after the war. And uh, with, with her husband, they had one son. His name was Walter, I remember that. We called him Wally. And, uh, and uh, of course, when we left Hungary, we lost all. We kept in touch with the son for a while. My father did with the son for a while. But then after my father passed away, we lost all touch with these people. And do you remember when your, when your parents were deported? Were they deported from the ghetto? I, re I don't remember, no, no. I don't remember my father being deported. I remember when my mother was deported. I remember when the last time I saw her alive. We, were, we lived in a special building before the ghetto. Those were called the star buildings, um, where they, they put all Jews in, into these buildings before they transferred them to the ghetto, before the ghetto was established. But the Jews lived in this so-called star building. And uh, the order came that anyone, any woman who has a younger child, chi a younger child, then three years old, does not have to report. They had to report to the uh, brick factory. And my mother was very scared because I was already three, over three years old. And the, uh, the con concierge of the building was a big Nazi. And my mother was afraid that because I was over three years old, that this Nazi, this concierge, is going to report her to the authorities and, sh and she's going to be deported. So when the order came that, have to re that they have to report my mother, my mother's sister, and my mother's uh, sister-in-law, they reported to the brick factory. and. I remember seeing her leave the building the last time I ever saw her alive. And when they reported to the brick factory, I found out later from the Holocaust archives from Germany that my mother, my mother's sister, the three women were deported from, hung, from the brick factory they were actually deported to Dachau and they were in Dachau for two weeks and after Dachau they were deported to Bergen-Belsen and I went to Bergen-Belsen and I looked up and there's a very thick book of the inmates who were, went through there and I did find the name of my mother and it just says gestorben, which in German means passed away. There's no date, there's nothing else, just the word that she passed away. That's all, that's all I could find in the records in, in the camp. But that, that's all I remember of my mother. I really don't remember her face or anything like that. I just remember her walking down the stairs and saying goodbye, and I never saw her again. And you were so young, you were so young at the time. I was three and a half years old. Ninth, I was born in 41. Yeah. It must have been such a trauma that... You know, I, I don't remember too much of it. All I do remember the trauma, if you're talking about trauma, the fact that I grew up without a mother, that, that did not help me. That really changed my whole personality and it affected the way my, my whole life. Even though my sister, my older sister was, was a very good to me and she was to me like my mother. And your father? My father came came back. He was he was uh, he could hardly walk. When did he come back? Was he came back in forty five. 
The war had already finished? Yes, yes. He, he was liberated by the Americans, Mauthausen. And uh, he came back in 45. He was, he could hardly walk. Mauthausen was a terrible, uh, it was a terrible place, Mauthausen. Yeah, Mauthausen was a, was a, was a very bad, very bad camp. He survived because of his brother, actually, the, the barber. Um, so you have a picture of, let's do first, this is a picture of your parents. Yes. We're going to show, and this is... No, this is it. And there's a picture here. No, that's, that's, that's my aunt. Talk about this. This is your father's... This is my father, father's youngest brother. He was a barber. He was not married. He ended up in a place called Bor in Serbia, which was a copper mine. And he did not make it. Didn't make it. Now, why am I telling you this? My father took part of his uh, barber equipment with him to Mauthausen and the Germans asked for a barber and my father says I'm a barber he had all he had all the tools and so the, he was he was shaving and cutting cut, uh, haircuts he gave haircuts and shaving to German officers and always another German guy was holding a gun to his head in case he makes a wrong move. So every time he gave a haircut, he got some extra food. And, uh, and after part of being a barber in the camp, they assigned him to an undertaker unit. And he and another three or four guys uh, also, all Hungarians, they were, they were doing, they were burying all the dead in Mauthausen. And many times they found things on the dead bodies that they could exchange for food. So that also helped him survive. Food was, if you had food, you may, there was a chance that you're going to survive. So that was part of the way that he survived, was, was he was a barber and he was an undertaker in the camp. So Joe, your, your father's brother? Yes. Which we'll just show the picture he's, By the way, his name is also was Joe. How did he give him the instruments? He, oh, no he, no, he didn't give him. My father took him. He had a lot of stuff at home, you know, being a barber, he had all kinds of haircutting equipment. And my father took some of it, some of his with him. In, in a way that saved his life. Yes, it helped, it helped save him life, save his life, yes. Yes, it did. Now he went through hell. He went, he went through, uh, they used to have, uh, in, the, in the labor camp that he was, they used to have, uh, um, line them up and they would tell them, you start counting. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Every one of them who counted ten was shot right on the spot. And he went through three or four of those and he survived it. And they told the, the people who came back who were with him said that his, his hair turned completely white. But then he survived, but then he, st he still, he didn't make it till the end. He died very, very late. I think almost at the very end of the war. He, he died in, the, in a cattle wagon. They were taking him somewhere, I don't know where, the, as the Germans were moving these people and they just threw his body out and that's it. Do you have a picture of your... That's my father with my two sisters. And your mother? And, oh yeah, excuse me, my, my mother and my, 
my mother, my father, and my two sisters, very, very young. It had, it had to be in 36, 37, something like that. My sister was born in 34, and the other one was 35. So this had to be like 36, 37. And you have a, a magnificent picture of your grandparents. Yes. This is my father's father, and this is my father's mother. They are buried in, in Budapest, Orthodox Jewish Cemetery. They're buried. What were the names? His name was Lajos, Lajos Louis Lajos. He died in 19, December 1941. So he was, they were able to have a funeral for him and he's, he's still there, buried there. This is the grandmother, this is my grandmother who saved five, five of the grandchildren. Her name was Ethel. And she was in the ghetto with you? Yes. If it weren't for her, I wouldn't be talking to you. She saved us. She's the one who really saved us. And she has a, a picture when you were a baby? Yeah, that's six months old. And this is a, a later yeah, picture. Uh, I don't know exactly, probably five, four or five years old. Do you know how these pictures survived? No. They survived in, in our apartment. Because our apartment, when we were taken to the ghetto, our apartment was taken over by a Christian family. And uh, apparently these pictures were in the, in the apartment and they did not throw them out. And when you came back after the liberation? Yes. Did you go back to that same apartment? <laughs> we tried to go back to the same apartment and they told us no way. So we found an apartment on the ground floor, the same building, and that's where we moved into. Now my father went to our old apartment, it was on the first floor, and these, uh, this family had all of our furniture, everything that we had in there, they just walked, moved in. And my father went there and he said, he told the man that this, this furniture, this part of furniture, this, this is all ours. And the man said, no, it's not yours because you were not supposed to come back. So my father went to the police and the police came and the police told the man, you have to return all this furniture that belongs to the Wiesners, you have to return to them. And we got, we, we got some of our furniture back from this family. But they told us that's not yours because we were told you're not supposed to come back. But it must have been so difficult living in the same building with people that didn't want you back. That's right. That's right. There were a lot, of, a lot of anti-Semites there. There was no shortage of anti-Semites in Hungary. No shortage. And what happened to the remainder of the family? I think you have pictures of... Well... Um, this is a picture of your family. Yes. Uh, if I could just see... This is of your... When, when was this picture taken? This must have been taken, uh, I'd say, 43, 44, something like that. I was, I think, two years old there, two, two years. This is one of the only pictures of the family intact? Of yes. The yes, this is it. Now this is an interesting picture. This has my my mother, my mother's parents, and her sisters, and her and her brother. Her brother was in the army. This is before the war. He was in the Hungarian army, and the woman, the woman next to him, was is his fiance. And the other, one of them is my mother, and the other two. Where is your mother in the picture? 
My mother is this one right here. She's right. If you can point again, your mother is... This is my mother right here. And Joe, what happened to... Do you know what happened to most of the people in the picture? Oh, okay. My grandfather and my grandmother were deported, Auschwitz. She, uh, this, and this, and they never survived? They disappeared. It's like they never lived. This is my mother's sister with her family. So I'm going to just show this. They, is were, they were deported to Auschwitz. The whole family? Yes, disappeared. So this is the only memory of the whole family? Yes. This is my mother's other sister. And uh, there is a picture of her with her husband. Uh, where is it? Uh, hold on for a second. Uh, no, I don't see the picture now. Just one second. But it's so sad uh, that in this picture, this is the whole family. This is the only memory. Yes, yes, that's it. This is my mother's sister. She uh, she died in Bergen Belsen right away. She was a heavy smoker, and uh, unfortunately, she traded uh, her bread for cigarettes. That was not a thing to do. There is another, there is a wedding picture. Hold on for a second. These pictures are so, so precious. They yes. so. I'm trying to find it. I don't see it. I don't see it, I know it without. One second. Yeah, we have. Ah, oh, here it is. Um, this is my mother's sister on her wedding day, December of 1939. She, uh, she died in Auschwitz. Her husband too. And did they have any children? Ah, uh, yes, she had one child. I don't, we don't know what happened. She had one child. I don't have a picture of it. So, Joe, from your family, there were very few survived, actually. Very few, very few. The, because because my family comes from the eastern part of Hungary. The, the next couple of places, Nyíregyháza is one, and Debrecen, which is a is more is a more well known city. Those are the eastern part of Hungary. And when the Germans occupied Hungary, as I mentioned, in 1944, that's where they started with the deportations. And Eichmann was very instrumental uh, in the deportation of the Eastern Hungarian Jews. Uh, it also included part of New Ukraine, like Munkac or Munkacevo and, and all those places, and, and the northern part of Transylvania, which is Romania now, um, like Siget, Marmor Siget, uh, Oradea, and many towns had large, large Jewish populations. And that's where they started. And when you say over 400,000 Jews were eliminated within a very short period of time, most of those Jews were from Eastern Hungary. Because deportations in Budapest were different. They were totally different. It happened in a, in a very short, very short period of time. Well, by that time, see, it was a well-oiled machine. Auschwitz was was gone at full, full, full force. I mean, full steam. 
as people who are coming in with the transports, undress gas crematorium, and very fast. They were, it was on a big industrial scale. What's, what's so sad is that the German war machine, they, were, yes. they knew they were losing it, they, they were losing the, the, the war. They were losing the war. Some of, them, some of them knew they were losing the war, some of them didn't believe that they are losing the war. And uh, even, though, even, though, even though the ones who, who knew they are losing the war, they wanted to finish the job. This was a war against the Jews. The Jew, they said, the Germans said, the Jews are our enemies. We have to finish the job. Just like now with Hamas, the Jews, we have to finish the Jews. We have to get rid of Israel. And October 7th will happen again and again and again. He said it openly on, on television. Well, please go on. We, we, we're going to prevent it. Well, we, the, the difference now is that we have an army. That's the only difference. Otherwise, otherwise the same. It's the same thing all over again. It's like like Cholachmanyo in a Seder, you say, every generation, they rise up against us, and we have, and when, with the Hashem's help, we overcome our enemies. The problem is, at what cost? That's the problem. And Joe, can I ask, when you came back after the war, yes. and you came back to your your building and to with yes, you yes. your sisters and, yes. and your father came back. How was the interaction when your father came back? Do you remember when the reunion? Not too much. No, I really don't remember. I remember him being in bed. He was very sick. That part I remember. I don't remember the exact moment. What my grandmother told us is that she was walking on the street and my father was coming in the opposite direction and <clears throat> he recognized my grandmother, which was his mother, and my grandmother did not recognize him. He was so far gone. And he kept on saying, mother, mother, who are you? Can you imagine an encounter like that? But that's the way it was. And then he recovered? He eventually recovered. It took him a year and a half. He eventually recovered. Another thing that I think saved him was that he was on the heavy side. So he could afford to lose weight. Because if you were skinny, you didn't have a chance. But he had uh, some extra fat, so to speak. So. Uh, he lost a lot. He came back, I don't know how much he weighed, 60 kilos or something. And did your grandmother, did she stay with you in the apartment? She did in the beginning, yes. She stayed with us and then eventually she got, she got an apartment for herself. But she used to come every day to help us and at night she would go home. And when did you know that your mother wasn't coming back? When did you know? Because uh, it was always... Maybe when did we know? Off. That's that's a good one. My father inquir inquired all the time, and uh, in the beginning, they said, "Wait, wait, wait. We don't know. A lot of people are lost. A lot of people are still coming back." Eventually, uh, we were told that she's not coming back. But really, they had very little record on her. Very, like I said, I. I, I I saw it in the book, in the Bergen Bells, and they had no very little record of her. They have very good record of when she uh, was taken to Dachau. I have her signature and the number assigned to her. Uh, but after she was transferred to Bergen Bells, uh, I have very little record of that. And it's so sad, but it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to, to grow up without a mother, without... It was not easy. It was not easy. That was my, that was my biggest problem. 
And your father, did he manage to to work? Did he manage? Yeah, yeah, to yeah. He, he, yeah, he went back to the business of the toy business until. Um, and he had the same partner or the same? No, no, no. He went on his own. He was he had no partner. But he kept in touch with. The oh yeah, yeah. He kept in touch with, uh, with the people that he worked with before, and. Uh, um, uh, uh, he was, the, the communists allowed uh, retail and he was, he was going to uh, um, county fairs and he, was bring, he would bring a lot of merchandise and the locals would buy it from him wholesale. So that made his job much easier. And then he would come home. And he would go all these county fairs from here to here. You know, did a lot of traveling. Now what happened was in 1954, I think, 53 or 54, two detectives came to our house and said, where's your father? I said, my father's here. They told my father, listen, we know that you are not retail, that you're doing wholesale business. It's against the law. We want you to stop it, because if you don't stop it, you're going to jail. So that was a warning. It was enough for him. He stopped. And he got a job in a, in a small, little, small little factory where they were making egg trays, you know, the trays for eggs. That's what, that's what he was doing. That's where he got a job. And as a child, would your father give you the new toys? Because I think it's every child's dream that the, the, the parents are... Yeah, yeah, I took some, I took some toys, but uh, my big thing was soccer. You know, I was, I was, uh, that was my number one, one uh, passion is playing soccer. And I had a bicycle and I used to ride my bike every day. That was my, and can I ask, Joe, going to school, how was it going to public school? Did you encounter any antisemitism? Yes, I did. Oh, yeah. Did I the knew. kids know you were Jewish? Sure, sure they knew I was Jewish. Uh, I, I was a very good player. So they had to watch how much antisemitism they were passing on to me because uh, they all wanted me to be on their team. So. That, uh, but I did encounter lots of anti-Semitism, but again, because I was a good player, that helped me get by. And did you have a lot of Jewish friends? Or? I had, I had three, three very good Jewish friends, yes. Three friends we had. One of them, let me see how this goes, one of them ended up in Belgium. Uh, uh, they all left the country in 56. One of them was my best friend, lives in New York City, in Queens. I sometimes talk to him. And uh, another one passed away. Those were my, oh, and another, two of them passed away. One of them was actually, I went to a school with him, grammar school together. And he ended up in Chicago, believe it or not. <laughs> And don't ask me how that happened. And in the grammar school, I have no explanation to it. It's amazing. In the grammar school, how were your teachers? Did your teachers know you were Jewish as well? Yes, yes, they knew me. I was a good student. Uh, I was getting all, all A's, and they knew I was Jewish. And um, there were no Jewish schools. No, grammar school. No, there was a gymnasium, which is a high school, was Jewish. But I, I was too young for that, so I, I was in grammar school. There were no Jewish grammar schools. And uh, my teachers knew I was Jewish. And some of them didn't like it, some of them didn't care. But the problem was that on Saturday we had school. And guess what, what was my subject on Saturday? Drawing. <laughs> so how am I going to do drawing? on Shabbos. So my father came in, and remember this is a communist system. 
So my father came and talked to the principal and said, listen, uh, we are Jewish and this and that, and, and uh, he should really not be doing any drawing. Uh, well, what do you want him to do? Can he read during class time? So the, the drafting teacher agreed, you don't have to draw, but I must see you read. <laughs> and that's what I ended up doing on Shabbos. I was reading books. <laughs> And Joe, can I ask, in your, in your home, did your father speak a lot about his experiences? Not too much, no. Not too much. Were you allowed to ask questions? Or yeah, sure. He, yeah, he, he didn't talk too much. Well, he told us that the one time they found a part of a horse's leg and they were chewing on it for two weeks. <laughs> And the, the truth is, there were very few survivors from that house. Yes, yes, very, very few. It was a, it was a, big, a very, very, very famous death camp because they worked very. They were um, in Mount House and they were breaking rocks, yeah. and you know, breaking rocks this is heavy physical work. And in order to do that kind of physical work, you have to have food. You have to, so they were just falling like flies, they left and right, they were just dying all over the place. And in your home, did you, a lot of the people that would come and visit, were they also survivors? Did your, was your home? So, a lot of them were survivors, yes. A lot of them were survivors. But um, there wasn't too much talk about what has happened. And with your sisters, did you ever, did you speak a lot about the war with your sisters? No, I didn't. I didn't really even talk. They used to tell me what, what happened. Because, you know, we did this with you, and we did this with you, and then and we played, and then... That's, that was it. But, uh, like you said before, that uh, uh, most of my family did not make it. That they didn't, I mean, cousins and aunts, aunts and uncles and, you know, disappeared. And like I say, most of them lived in the eastern part of the country and the deportations took place. And have you ever gone back to, to Hungary? Yes, yes, I went back. I went back uh, two or three times already. Was it difficult to go back? Yes, yes. I didn't want to speak Hungarian. I didn't know. I didn't want to speak Hungarian. You still remember your Hungarian? Yeah, yeah, I can speak it. Yeah, I understand it, and I didn't want to speak it. And like I said, uh, when we went back, I visited. I visit every time I go back. I visit the, the Orthodox Jewish cemetery for my grandfather and my grandmother. And um, and does your apartment does it still remain? It's there, yes, it's there. Have you ever gone inside? Uh, that's a good question. It was interesting. The first time we went back was in 1984, I think. Something like that. And uh, we went to the building, the Barton building, and I knocked on the door, and a woman came out, and she, she wanted to know what's what. I, I told her, I used to live here. Oh yeah, okay, fine. I said, can I come inside? She said, yeah, you come on inside. So I went inside and not much changed. The apartment is almost the same as it was when we left. And that was my, that, that was my fir first time. And, and the second and third time I went, um, there was nobody answering the door. So we couldn't go, ah, I don't care, I didn't go inside. So, but, but I was in the building. I mean, I, everything I recognized in the building. And did you feel when you went back, did you feel a connection? Did you feel no, no connection. Uh, it's, it's a suppressed feeling, mm -hmm. uh, psychologically, I think, that uh, I, I, I have no, I have not, nothing to do with it. Like I say, my only connection is, is the cemetery, that's it. And Joe, when you got married, and with, with your, your son and your daughter, did you speak to them about you being a survivor? Yeah, sure, sure. They know. They know I'm a survivor. And I told them a few stories here and there. But they were well aware of the fact that uh, I'm a Holocaust survivor, yes. 
and the grandkids, they interested in the questions? Yeah, the grandkids, they asked a lot of questions, a lot of questions. And, uh, you know, whenever I, whenever I could tell them, I tell them. Whatever I remember, I tell them. <laughs> and so, that's about it. I want to ask you, what message do you give to your family, to the future generations, especially that we're living in these very Bad difficult times? times. Yes, yes. Uh, you, you can't give up. If my message is, hang in there, don't give up. You have to fight. You have to fight because uh, the Jews were known not to fight back. A very docile people. The Jews are a docile people. They're not like Hamas or the Muslims. The Muslims, very docile. Jews don't like to fight back. But the Jew in, in Israel, I think, is a different Jew. It's a different Jew. It's, it's a totally different mental attitude. Total different mindset that uh, it, it's all it's in I'm in awe at seeing the soldiers going into battle knowing that any second they're gonna get a bullet in their head that that to me that is that is unexplainable of course if 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 they saw the movies that these these butchers took, I would be mad as hell too, and fight like crazy. What they did to the women and the children. It's, it's the worst, October the 7th is the worst day in Jewish history since the Shoah. Yes, yes. They call it Black Sabbath. It's a Black Sabbath. It's the... It's like Tisha B'Av. It's a Joe, and are you happy you made the decision to come live in Israel? Yes, yes. I'm very satisfied. When I was a kid, we belonged to Hashomer Hatzair. I don't know if you're familiar with it. And uh, my sisters tell me, I don't remember it so well, at night before I went to sleep, I would stand on the bed and, and uh, sing, uh, Hatikva. <laughs> well, where, where did that come from? <laughs> and you, but your family were they a Zionistic family? Were they? Oh, uh, not so much. My father, my sisters, yes, but they they belong. Uh, in 1948-49, a lot of the uh, these youth youth movements, youth organizations in Hungary. Um, encouraged and very much encouraged Aliyah. So my two sisters signed up. They were part, we were part of, Hash I was too young, Hashemir Hatzair, okay? And the whole group that we belonged to, from one day to the next, they disappeared. And they all came to Israel. So they said, why, what about your sisters? They told my sisters, that you cannot bring your brother with you. Why? He's too young. So when they said that if you cannot bring, if you can, if you, we, if we cannot bring our brother with us, we're not going. And they stayed behind. And that whole group that was in, in the room, they all came to Israel. So I, I held them back. <laughs> But look, you came eventually. Eventually. <laughs> it took a few more years. Ja, I just want to thank you. I'm so incredibly grateful oh. to you. No, you don't have to be okay. grateful. I'm grateful you came. It's been, it's been such an honor and a privilege. So really, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to you. And it's such an honor to have your grandson as a patient. Oh yeah, but, uh, <laughs> Joe, really, Aaron. Yeah. Aaron, but Joe, he's really, named after my uh, uh, my father. He's named after my father, Aaron. Well, I'm really grateful because he told me about you. But Joe, really, your story and what you went through, yeah. it's, it's 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 somewhat, miraculous. Somewhat There's so unique, many miracles, yeah. and it's somewhat unique, but everybody has a story. But it's so important that you tell it and people see it. Yes. 
and and you've made a life and and it's incredible yeah. against all odds you survived yeah. you triumphed and uh, it's been such an honor and privilege you should just have nachas oh, mazel and brocha oh, and maybe stream you in too. good health you too now, i really really appreciate it no i'm problem. so grateful to you no problem i'm glad you came so thank you very, very, very much. You're welcome.